so now let's get into the street three stage model of motor learning and this is a you know again you're probably familiar with it you just don't understand uh, why it's called the three stage model but you probably do this in rehab you probably do this in everyday life um, but this is called the Fitz and Posner three stage model so the first uh, stage they say is called the cognitive stage so you're understanding the nature of the task let's say it's walking so you understand the nature of the task you're going to develop strategies used to carry out the task and determining how the task is evaluated so this at this stage the person is going to experiment with a variety of strategies to get from point a to point b and really if it'll abandon those that do not work okay so they're going to try all different things and they say okay this is how i get from point a to point b and basically i'm going to accomplish the task okay but then at this stage you're going to try different things so let's just not try uh say uh walking but we can say reaching uh, you're going to try different ways of reaching. You might say reach to the right, reach to the left, reach at an angle, reach. With a, but then you'll finally figure out what works and what doesn't work. So the cognitive stage. The second stage is the associative stage. It may last week, days to weeks or months depending on the performance intensity. So at this stage, we find the best strategy and ha now refines the skill. So now you're saying, okay, you know what? I have... 10 different ways I can get from my couch to the bathroom, right? There's 10 different strategies I can use. In the associative stage, I'm going to use the one that makes takes the less amount of time and the least amount of effort. So then you refine that skill. And then after you've done that, basically you go into the autonomous stage. Is that Now it's just automatic. You don't even think about it. It's like riding a bike, right? That's a good example. Is a, Or swimming, just automatic. You don't even have to think about it low degree of attention required for performance. Okay. So what's the clinical implications of this stage? Uh, um, the first stage, the task requires a great deal of attention and conscious thought. So when you're working with a patient, when you're first working with the task at hand, it's going to require a lot of your attention and you're going to, and they're going to need conscious thought. So you can't have a noisy background and a whole bunch of things going on if they're in the first stage of motor learning. In the second stage, the movements become refined. So if you had a little background noise, or uh, that's fine. In the third stage, tasks become automatic. Now you're able to carry on a conversation and perform a task. So here's here's some good examples, and uh, here's where clinicians sometimes uh, fail. Okay, they don't recognize what stage of motor learning the patient is in, and they try to do something in the third stage when they haven't mastered the first stage. Um, so for example, novice golfers are better at putting. But experienced golfers need a dual task. Soccer players better at dribbling with a dominant foot with a dual task, eyes closed, versus simple task of non-dominant foot. Okay, so when novice golfers, let's say someone that's never golfed before, they're actually better putters. Okay, they're, they're very good putters. Uh, um, but experienced golfers, they need to do two things at once so they need distraction they need noise they need something because putting is too simple for them okay they need some kind of distraction or a dual task in order to become better at it uh, same thing with soccer players they're better at dribbling with the dominant foot with dual tasks they can dribble 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 with eyes closed versus if you just ask them to kick the ball with their non-dominant uh, foot okay so we and the stages of motor learning and I, uh, uh, one of the things that you want to do is in order to keep it fresh in the third stage is when you're brushing your teeth try to use your left hand once in a while when you're um, uh, when you're taking a shower kind of uh, uh, sometimes close your eyes and see if you can uh, reach for the soap and shampoo with your eyes closed um, when you're going to school or when you're going to work, don't take the same uh, path each time. Try to mix it up. Take the streets, one, uh, the local streets. Take the freeway one time. Get off one exit earlier and see if you can navigate versus just something. So that way the motor learning continues to go on. It's when we get into that automatic stage, the third stage, we become lazy and then motor learning doesn't occur. Now... <laughs> Another approach, uh, Bernstein's three-stage approach to motor learning. Uh, the first stage, uh, reduction of number of degrees of freedom of joints controlled to a minimum. Uh, hammer at elbow only. Okay. 
Second stage is advanced. The performer begins to release additional degrees of freedom. So that now you hammer at the elbow and the shoulder. And the third stage become the expert. So individual released all degrees of freedom to perform that. Now you're hammering with the, using the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist. All right. So Bernstein's approach is just minimizing the joints that we're working on. Okay. So sit to stand. Maybe you just work on the knee first. Then the second stage you work on the knee and the hip. And third stage you work on the knee, hip, and ankle. So that's the three stage approach that Bernstein uses. What are some clinical implications? Explanation for presence of co-activation of muscles during early stages of acquiring more skill. Uh, new rationale for using developmental stages in rehab. And importance for providing external support during early phases of motor learning. So transitioning from all fours to upright kneeling to an independent stance. Right, so we're not going to try to get an independent stance if we can't get on all fours or we can't go upright kneeling. So that's like, uh, remember, you're trying to do a pistol squat uh, 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 on an uneven surface when you can't even do a regular squat. You have to take it in stages. So same thing with rehab, neurological rehab. You have to take it in stages. Limitations, principles that govern motor learning processes to lead to the last stage of mastery largely unknown. So there's such a large uh, uh, variance of what can lead to mastery or uh, 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 of this that uh, the research isn't that conclusive. Now Gentile's two-stage model of motor learning. So the first stage is develop an understanding of the task dynamics. Um, we'll talk about long-term athletic development on that. And then second stage is a fixation or diversification refine the movement. Now one example that I wanted to give before um, we went to the next stage was uh, Malachi. So Malachi uh, is a young uh, child with cerebral palsy, severe cerebral palsy. So if you put Bernstein's three-stage approach into uh, effect, Malachi has significantly impaired trunk postural control, right? So if the trunk has no postural control, that constrains his ability to move his arms because if you don't have postural control, you can't move your arms. So external support is provided by the therapist at different trunk segments in order to limit the degrees of freedom, right? So that goes into Bernstein's three-stage approach of limiting certain movements and degrees of freedom trunk segments that Malachi has to control. Once the level of trunk support provided by the therapist is optimal relative to Malachi's ability to control the unconstrained therapy segment, trunk segments, postural control as a constraint on upper extreme functions is lessened and Malachi is freer to explore his capability for upper extremity movement. So basically, if you go back to the theory, right, Bernstein says we need to reduce the number of degrees of freedom of joints control to minima to minimum, right? So if you you have a trunk support, you're totally supported, then we're reducing the number of degrees. Then we slowly release those uh, uh, confinements and then he's able to perform more and more and more. So it works well with kids, uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, this is a good approach for those that don't have good postural control. All right, Gentile's two-stage uh, model. Uh, again, the first stage is developing understanding of the, the task uh, dynamics, and the second stage is fixation diversification. Now, important factor in retraining motor skills is the amount of practice. So I don't know if you remember uh, Alan Iverson. Remember uh, Alan Iverson? He said it's only practice, man. But here's something that's actually very important. One properly reference, uh, Malcolm Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to master a skill, which translates to about nine years. Consider five days a week, spending four hours a day in order to master a skill. But you don't need to master every skill. You need, only need to learn it, right? Motor learning, and that can take roughly 20 to 30 hours. So if you're not spending 20 to 30 hours uh, a week on motor learning, 
then you're not going to get the carryover, the long-term success that you're looking for. Also, same thing with education. If you're not spending 20 to 30 hours on your schooling, you're only spending one to two hours here and there and working full time and uh, doing that, well, then you're not going to get the grades that you think that you, you should deserve, right? People always say, oh, I deserve an A. Uh, well, you got to put the effort into it. You need to put 20 to 30 hours uh, into it. And you're like, oh, Patel, that's not reasonable. I got to work. I got to support. Well, then your grades will suffer. Right? So you got to find a balance of work and education. Now, there's uh, different kinds of feedback that we'll talk about. Now, feedback is uh, definitely important in learning, motor learning. Intrinsic feedback is, okay, am I stepping on something that's stable, unstable, so that we have some sensory feedback? Um, visual, am I, can I see it? Am I in a dark place? So that visual feedback will determine or influence our motor learning. Then we have extrinsic feedback. That's where the therapist comes in, right? The therapist will say, okay, lift your foot higher, bend your knee, uh, uh, bend at the hips. That's extrinsic feedback. That information supplements intrinsic feedback. Okay, so those are the two different kinds of feedbacks. Now, the knowledge of results, KR, terminal feedback about outcome of movement in terms of movement's goal. Uh, initially, we want to give more feedback, and then obviously we want to be less. So if you're te teaching a patient to go up and down stairs first, you're going to give a lot of feedback for safety. But once they master that, you're going to back off on the feedback. They won't learn the skill if you're always there giving them feedback. The, the brain has to, to be able to do most of it on their own. Right? So feedback is important. But we don't want to give too much feedback later on in our rehab. What happens here is family. You know, family is constantly, constantly giving feedback. And unfortunately, they, they actually hinder the uh, progression of a patient if they're always giving their, like, come on, honey, lift your foot. Now, their intention is good, but they're not going to be able to uh, uh, learn if the, the feedback is not slowly lessened over time. Uh, practice conditions, the more you practice, uh, you give a patient, the more the patient learns. Uh, mass practice, amount of practice time in a trial greater than the amount of rest between trials. Um, this may increase fatigue and therefore injury, so you have to be careful. So amount of practice time in a trial greater than that. So for patients that are fatigued easily, you might actually have to increase rest periods versus trial periods. So what an example is, let's say you do a task for a minute. Well, they might need five minutes of rest initially. Then as you get better, then you do a task for one minute and only rest for a minute, one to one. But if you try to do too, uh, too many tasks with not enough rest, you might injure them. And you want to distribute the practice, the amount of rest between trials to or greater than the amount of time for the trial, right? So you want to rest between trials, okay? Or let's say you come in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, sometimes come in Monday, Thursday, or Monday, Friday, and stagger it as well. So you're, you're, you're changing the practice conditions, not the same thing, you know, two o'clock every Monday, Wednesday. Some people need that routine, but the brain learns when there's a, a variety. So same thing when you go work out, right? And you're working with clients, you don't do the same thing. It's like, okay, we're going to get on the bike. Then we're going to do the leg press. Then we're going to do that. No, if you do that for four weeks, that's fine. But if you don't mix it up, A, you're going to lose the client and they're going to be bored and there's no motor learning that occurs. Your body's not going to respond as well. Uh, you want to have variable practice increases, ability to adapt and generalize learning. So change the practice up. Contextual interference occurs when multiple skills are practiced within a single session. So don't just practice reaching for an hour. Well, do reaching, do sit to stand, maybe uh, do a little bit of walking. So uh, do different things. And then random practice, most effective when used with skills that use different patterns of coordination, right? So don't, uh, like I said, when you go to the gym, don't always start out with the bench press or the, change it up a little bit. Like when you do back and by, chest and try, you change it up and then uh, you do something else. You do pulls and pushes, uh, whatever the case may be, but you're changing it up every four to six weeks. Same thing with motor learning. Uh, task analysis, identifying components of a skill or movement and ordering them into sequence. Uh, the amount of transfer depends on similarity between two tasks or two environments. 
and then mentally practicing the skill can produce positive effects on performance of a task. So mental practice, uh, telling the patient, you don't always have to do it. Just sit there on the sofa and imagine you going up and down the stairs. Athletes do that all the time. Uh, uh, Steph Curry uh, uh, imagines in the, him doing free throws uh, about 30 minutes a day. He always sees, he says that he sees the ball going through the net. Boom, boom, boom. For a half hour a day, he practices that. So obviously it works. Uh, guidance, learner physically guided through the task to be uh, learned. And then there's a challenge point framework, theoretical framework for organizing learning environment. So these are all things that can influence motor learning. Now, recovery of function, right? Our main goal is to get the patient to recover and functionally be able to uh, walk, uh, functionally be able to drive, maybe functionally be able to uh, get dressed, functionally be as something functional. Uh, concepts related to the recovery of function. Function means a complex activity of the whole organism directed at performing a behavioral task. Recovery is regaining function lost after injury and compensation is behavioral substitution. So a lot of times we will see compensation occur in order to produce the function. So we have to make sure that we are trying to minimize compensation and increase function. Now, <clears throat> concepts related to the recovery of function. Now remember, our goal is to get our patients back to function, not compensation. So there's different kinds of recovery of function. So spared function is when a function is not lost despite a brain injury. So sometimes an example would be even though a child suffers some kind of brain injury, their language is not lost. So they spared that function. Uh, the recovery can be spontaneous and forced. So spontaneous recovery happens regardless of any kind of intervention. And forced recovery would be with that intervention. So those are the two kinds of recoveries. There's nothing we can do about spontaneous recovery. It'll happen on some, some on some patients it'll be better than others. So forced recovery is obtained through specific interventions designed to have impact on neural mechanisms. So that's our goal right here, this forced recovery here as therapists. Now, Factors uh, affecting the recovery of function, well, effects of stage of development, the age, how old are they? Brain reacts differently to injury at different stages of development, so um, sometimes uh, patients can heal better if they're younger, uh, it just depends. Uh, characteristics of the lesion, injury severity indicator rather than predictor of recovery. So where is the injury? Where is it located? When did it happen? Those are all characteristics of the lesion that will predict or uh, have an influence on the recovery of function. And the small lesion, greater chance of recovery, of course, as long as the functional area has not had been entirely removed. Uh, Pre-injury neuroprotective factors, uh, pre-injury exercise, environmental enrichment, dietary restriction. So what was the patient's health prior to the injury? Uh, did they do any exercise? Did they, what kind of environment were they living in? What kind of diet did they have? So that plays a, a role as well. Now, do you think that if a patient exercised prior to their injury, if they were in a good environment and if they had good uh, diets, they recovered faster? Of course, <laughs> right? A good diet, good exercise, and if they were in good shape prior to their stroke, they obviously recovered uh, uh, faster. So the patients that had the best recovery were the ones that exercised and had a good diet prior to that. But usually if you have a good uh, diet and exercise, you hopefully you can prevent the stroke altogether. So... Um, some post-injury factors, pharmacological treatments reduce nervous system's reaction to injury and promote recovery of function. So the first sign of a stroke, you should uh, get to the hospital as soon as possible. Um, what's the difference between Bell's palsy and a stroke? So if a patient is unable to smile on one side and unable to lift their arm on one side, then most likely they had a stroke. If they can lift both arms and... Uh, 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 but they can only smile on one side, then it's probably Bell's palsy. Either way, you want to get to the, um, the hospital as soon as possible so they can give you some blood thinners and reduce the effects on the, the brain. If it's Bell's palsy, then they can give you corticosteroids and antiviral uh, as soon as possible. 
Uh, some neurotropic factors such as insulin-like growth factors may contribute to plasticity and post-injury training activities use specific rather than generalized. So you want to be very specific, which we've talked about. Uh, some clinical implications. Uh, the therapist concerned with structuring therapy to maximize acquisition and recovery of function. So you want to focus on function and positive negative pre-injury factors will influence the degree of function regain. So how healthy were they prior to the injury and what happened? Now, if they're born with the injury, then uh, their post-injury factors, uh, I mean, it's, it's negligible, All right? All right.